Hey guys, um, how are we doing? We're here with another podcast today with Thibaut Marshall um, from Wasabi Wallet and been in the Bitcoin space quite a few years. Um, obviously, totally crazy market at the moment, so we'll touch on that and then we'll, we'll talk going to privacy. So go do a bit of a deep dive and all that good stuff. So Tib, do you want to just um, give a bit of a background and just share your orange pill journey briefly? Sure thing, yeah. Thank you for having me, man. It's uh, it's a pleasure. Um, we had a great talk last time, so good to have this one on record. Um, so, I mean, the Bitcoin journey, uh, where to start? Um, Francis Pouliot was one of the the orange pillars, I guess, for me. Um, just running around on the McGill campus in Montreal in Canada in 2013, 14, giving away paper wallets. And I was like, what the fuck is this guy doing? Uh, <laughs> and uh, I remember it was, so maybe, you know, memories are always fuzzy, but it was close to the time when um, this billionaire, uh, uh, Tim uh, Draper, actually bought a big portion of the funds that were seized on Mongox. Oh, no, on Silk Road, actually, not Mongox. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, like, I was just uh, curiously, um, observing that whole thing, but didn't make any, uh, you know, any more research, any, didn't buy any. Um, and I actually got into it more. It was the broader crypto stuff. Uh, when I was working in venture capital in my previous fiat, uh, life that was in 2016, 17, uh, when the firm actually had, uh, invited this, uh, you know, crypto guru. Uh, he was like, basically, uh, an insider who got uh, a deal in the pre-mine of Ethereum and got filthy rich out of it. Uh, and so he was kind of, uh, you know, the light guiding everybody in the firm in terms of how to uh, build a thesis around crypto, which was, you know, whatever. Um, and through that process of, you know, being exposed to, you know, building the thesis internally, looking into how to allocate in all these shitcoin tokens, um, I gradually fell down the rabbit hole. Um, and actually ended up joining a company called Knox Custody, which does Bitcoin custody infrastructure because at the time, remember in 2017, um, there was just no custody for quote unquote institutions, right? So if you're a firm and you want to buy some Bitcoin or let alone shit coins, um, yeah, you had to do it with Trezor and your, um, basically in your office desk, which was very much, uh, precarious and not the thing to do. Um, so I joined the company that was building um, kind of a, an enterprise product at the time, helped them on the on sales, product, marketing and whatnot. Um, and I've held them for the last uh, four years close. Um, and then left Canada in 2020 after getting a big fine uh, for doing a barbecue. And I'll, I'll, I'll leave it as that. We were just celebrating the halving for Bitcoin. And uh, man, we got a $1,500 fine each. It was with Francis Pouliot again, this time as a, as a friend and another colleague of, of mine. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, came back to, uh, to Europe um, and built a small Bitcoin exchange, Bitcoin brokerage, I would say. Um, that I ended up um, selling uh, recently because of. Uh, call it founder disagreements uh, and now i'm uh helping out wasabi wallet and trying to help uh, uh make uh, bitcoin fungibility um a thing right making uh bitcoin privacy great again if it ever was yeah brilliant um that's a good intro and um yeah just on the like you said the francis pulio going around the campus is that like the video of him just throwing papers wallets into the crowd is that like where you yeah you got a, oh my god like that's was, did you get one of those ones like were you in the crowd like is that how no i'm up? telling you I, I thought it was kind of a weird cult i was like i don't want to be part of this <laughs> <laughs> god yeah how dumb was i right and just a venture capital like um i like I suppose it's kind of getting into the market stuff but um I think personally, a lot of the problem with where we are in the space is um, like the way fiat based kind of crypto VC has led the space down, you know, this just insane path where now everyone's getting rugged because of it. Um, 
why do you think that they don't get it so bad like all the big vc firms like a16z like how are they going so wrong with all this stuff well i mean we're, we're assuming they got anything right in the first place did they ever you know like they've been basically uh you know the sort of uh cantillionaires right very close to the money spigot um funding companies that have been overpriced um and i'm not even talking about the crypto quote-unquote space right just other companies i remember uh, it was this big fund um from uh from japan uh who was basically uh, blowing up uh valuations of private companies uh that had completely unprofitable business models um and i mean for for bitcoin and crypto in particular because they rarely invest in bitcoin only businesses i think vcs just don't understand the um, what's happening like it's they see it as um what they've always seen which is oh this thing is about a technological revolution but there's nothing revolutionary in the tech that is being uh utilized in bitcoin like it's been out there for decades, right? All the cryptography, distributed system, topology, you know, all of that stuff has been around for, for years. Um, this whole thing is about, as, as you and I know, it's a monetary evolution. It's not a revolution, it's, a, it's an evolution and it's about money, it's not about tech. But I think most VCs don't understand that. They have the wrong lens. And so because of that lens, they're always going to be looking for well the next crypto that is faster that is more green that you know is more efficient in terms of power usage um so on and so forth and because of that uh you know they'll be uh, misled in their quest because basically you know bitcoin is not the first cryptocurrency bitcoin is the last cryptocurrency that was ever invented um following you know other privately held and issued uh, digital currency and e-cash systems which arise in, in the 90s right um that that's the first i guess um side of the answer the second i would say is just the incentive of pump and dumps um you know i16z i think in 2018 or 19 they registered as a as a as part of a financial services uh dealer i think though well, i may be wrong on the exact classification of the license but Basically, it allowed them to trade uh, securities, right? Uh, because I think most of the partners, they're not dumb guys. They know that these all these tokens are securities, unregistered security offerings. And so, yeah, just buying the pre-sale at a 30% discount, pumping it with your big name because you're in Menlo Park uh, and you have some credentials having invested in Google and Facebook, um, and then dump in on retail and rinse and repeat right it's been uh it's been the case it's been a very profitable um business model for these funds for these insi insider traders um so so yeah i think that's why they don't get it they don't get it because they have the wrong heuristics and because they have the wrong incentives and do you think like do you think it's um they're kind of in well, for the most part, insidious, um, or is it just incentive blindness where they're kind of justifying their own actions to themselves? I mean, there's a lot of, uh, yeah, I mean, insider trading, you know, the revolving door between, uh, you know, regulators and, and corporates. I mean, we've seen it with, say, um, this outright uh, uh, scam, which is uh, Ripple and XRP, right? um the guy who built actually the bit license you know used to be i don't know if he's still there but used to be uh, uh, uh an executive at ripple right uh so it's clearly a regulatory capture right and that is true in the silicon valley as well um you know i i think I man the last thing i saw was adam newman you know the ceo ex-ceo of um we work yeah which is on its own, again, uh, a really good example of how unsustainable business models are in, in those businesses uh, that are funded by Silicon Valley investors. Uh, this guy now, um, after you know, misleading a bunch of, of his investors in his previous venture, launched another one that is backed by Andreessen Horowitz. 
I think it's uh, about tokenizing carbon credits. So it's a scam over a scam, right? Uh, and he's well funded. I think they announced seventy million dollars. Um, but you know, for what? Like you and I know that both of these things are vaporware. And um, and yeah, I mean, it's very much you know who knows who uh, kind of uh, kind of politics and incentives. And it's um, yeah, it's uh, it's only about insider trading and and just. Um, um, yeah helping out each other and um and then yeah using using the social clout that they have to uh to dump on more gullible retail investors yeah and i look i think this has kind of morphed into like a almost a cancer or something now that's ended up like it, it all stemmed from this but it's ended up where we are today with just you know huge exchange blow-ups and like no one like i i think that well, say with like FTX, um, what's happened there? Like, there's a load of other exchanges, obviously doing similar things, and like they're all kind of coming out saying now that they're going to be bringing out proof of reserves soon, and like it just <laughs> seems that like this is a this is a, a yeah, deflection yeah. to try and stop the run on the exchange, like. Um, but uh, so look, it just like you you wrote a very popular article in Bitcoin Magazine called "The Great Plague of Shitcoinery." Um, it's very relevant to again how we've got here today so like i suppose how can how could we have prevented get what the market getting to this state and like um how do we get ourselves out of this problem um for like because I, I suppose down the road i'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this but i imagine this would be used for a massive regulatory attack on bitcoin itself mm -hmm. um so yeah uh, so yeah, so how how how, could, how do you think we could have prevented get getting to this position, and then like how do we get ourselves out of it? Yeah, I mean these are all really good questions, right? Uh, how could you have prevented FTX or or Mongox or other hacks in the past, right? Um, well, I guess the first thing is hold your own keys. It's as simple as that. Um, most Bitcoiners know this because they've been burnt in the past, right? Um, I've been burnt in the past on on some shit coins back in 16, 17, right? Um, and I'm not the only one. Um, I, I think, yeah, they're just saying it's like most people are born shit corners and you become a Bitcoiner via just work and, you know, diligent, um, a, a, you know, seeking the truth, right? You're diligently seeking the truth and trying to, uh, to have a intellectually rigorous process by which you um you yeah you seek information and and uh and also kill your your biases um because you know there's a lot of a uh, lot of newcomers who come to uh the broad crypto space whether it is to you know buy nfts or icos or all that crap uh just to get rich quick right um and that is perhaps sort of another really interesting uh, phenomenon today is because the, the money is broken because nobody can save uh, people struggle financially. And so they're looking for a quick way out of that struggle and um, speculation on very risky, outright fraudulent investment schemes is definitely something that's uh that's part of it it's part of the uh the um, exit option for for some people who ultimately will get burnt and will uh you know get back to uh, to zero or negatives um if they trade and, and use leverage um so how going back to your question right how do we prevent ftx from happening or other ftx's in the future yeah again i don't think for instance proof of reserves is is a good thing because um it further legitimizes the use of custodial services right and it only tells one side of the equation it talks about the assets but it doesn't talk about the liabilities what you really want is a proof of solvency right you want to actually understand that there's a one one ratio between or bigger than one between your assets and liabilities. Um, the problem proof of reserves doesn't tell that. And proof of reserves also, just on the asset side, can be gamed, 
you can borrow, you can, you know, get get some funds and and prove that you have them. But yeah, it, it doesn't say it, it gives you a snapshot today. It doesn't tell you if you had those funds for the last six months or if you will have them in the next six months. And of course, as I just said, it doesn't tell you about well how many liabilities I have against those assets. Um, and that will always require, in my view, um, some form of audit, right? Some form of third-party independent firm, which ultimately, yes, there is independence. Yes, there is, you know, professional work integrity, but also there is fraud. Also, there is reasonable amount of trust that you have to, uh, to give them. Um, so, yeah, proof of solvencies could be useful, though there is a degree of trust. And that's why ultimately there's nothing that beats the go the good old you know not your keys not your bitcoin um so yeah to prevent future blow-ups like this in my view you need more businesses like unchained capital right or or casa even uh but unchained capital i think being uh being one of the interesting ones or perhaps river even though River are custodial, but they built their own infra. Uh, because Unchain, what they do is that they're they're a collaborative custody service provider. So they never actually have full control over your Bitcoin, um, unless of course you you're using a, a product that they offer, such as a Bitcoin back loan, right? In which case you gotta uh, basically give away the control of your collateral. That makes sense. But for a regular custody they actually don't hold all your keys and so this is very good because it is provable on chain verifiable um lack of rehypothecation for instance which usually is the trigger in all these big uh, systemic risks that originate from these big blow-ups so in simple terms they don't give away or they don't relend the Bitcoin that you've uh, you've uh, custodied with them because they just can't, right? So, I think this is really the the thing that most people should remember all the time is you want to deal with companies that cannot be evil, not companies that tell you they're not going to be evil because you never know. They today it may be true, but tomorrow they may be coerced into being evil against their will, or they may be you know doing mistakes or errors and omissions like these things happen because businesses are run by by humans and humans are valuable so yeah 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 it's like i suppose if it can happen it it probably will happen um especially mm -hmm. if Murphy's the, law. yeah like uh, well especially if the regulatory environment kind of turns increasingly hostile um towards bitcoin um amongst other things but um yeah so like what what do you think is going to happen from like do you think the regulators in the us the eu they're going to use this or do you think it will just kind of go maybe a bit go under the radar um slip away what, what do you think yeah that's another good question i mean um some bitcoiners are even saying that this was a state attack right ftx because it you know it gives them a really good example of oh we need more regulation you know um more transparency we need uh we need very strict custody policies so that users can't you know withdraw there cannot be rehypothecation or i don't know more rules generally speaking more kyc and more control um yeah i mean you know the FTX was in a way, quote unquote, like it's a it's the equivalent of a terrorist attack, right? And we all know what happened after that. Uh, there's been the Patriot Act in the U.S., and there's been just mo way more um, normalized surveillance of everything, from travel to communication and so on. Um, I think it's going to be true for for Bitcoin and the broader shitcoin industry, right? Um, I mean, it, it was already the case because, to your point, if it can happen, it will happen, right? And and there are all the incentives are aligned to actually, you know, see more regulation and more um, control over 
on and off ramps for Bitcoin. And sure, the broader shitcoin market, but that I care less about it. Um, and yeah, what's this going to do is, well, more KYC, perhaps whatever, like investor, um, you know, qualification or restrictions based on your profile to access certain products. Um, perhaps self custody is going to be, you know, limited in some jurisdictions because operationally it is a burden for businesses to manage, but also in terms of compliance, quote unquote, um, it is something that is um, hard to to uh, to manage for for businesses themselves, right? How can you prove that um, the wallet in which I withdraw as a KYC user, well, is the wallet that I control and not a payment to another wallet, right? You don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some ways to to verify this, but um, yeah, it's very limited. So I think, yeah, more regulation overall, um, which will ultimately make building Bitcoin businesses more expensive for entrepreneurs, um, which ultimately will reduce the amount of competition which ultimately brings lower quality services, higher fees, and ultimately the consumers are going to be paying for it. I mean, that's classic in any kind of uh, regulatory uh, oversight um, and a new regime for that. Um, but also on the bright side, I think it, it brings much more um, incentive for entrepreneurs, uh, developers, um, and just overall Bitcoiners to build um, kind of businesses and products that are outside the realm of regulation uh, without being uh, illegal in a way, right? Uh, unlawful. Uh, that, of course, requires a bit more creativity. You know, we, we're, we've seen some of these platforms um, like peer-to-peer -peer, um, ways to buy and sell BTC, right, with very little or just no KYC. Um, that's good. That's a good thing. They've been, of course, historically harder to use, less liquidity, so you pay for premium in terms of the, the spot price. Um, but um, I think, yeah, now and, and in the future, there's going to be more and more incentives for, for people to build those types of products. Um, and, and that should, you know, fracture even more, in my view, the, the usage of Bitcoin. If, if we're seeing right now Bitcoin... Um, separating itself from the crypto the broader shitcoin market that's already happening in my view it's happened and we're seeing bitcoin only companies we're seeing all these services that are 100 percent tailored um towards the needs of bitcoiners that's great so we're seeing kind of like you know some people refer to it as the circular economy that's kind of uh being being uh being built that's that's a good thing um but yeah, even I would say within Bitcoin, you're going to see yeah the sort of regulated usage of Bitcoin, which will be custodial, KYC only, very little or no privacy, of course, with chain analysis, surveillance tools, and we can talk about it uh, later. Um, and IOUs, meaning that you know you're going to be getting artificial exposure to the price of Bitcoin, but um, you won't be able necessarily to redeem it in actual physical Bitcoin that you can control on your wallet, holding your own keys. And then you're going to see, of course, in my view, we're seeing it already, like kind of the, the black market usage of Bitcoin, which um, in that case, it's outside the realm of any regulation, uh, which is by default um, self-custodial, so non-custodial. Um, privacy first is going to be very much the nerve of the like the, the core of the the battle in my view in the coming decade privacy is going to be a really important matter to discuss and to, to think about and focus on um and um and yeah perhaps it'll be a bit harder to interact between those two right if i have bitcoin on my personal wallet that has been coin joined can i really sell um, that Bitcoin on a regulated exchange like uh, Kraken or Coinbase? Maybe not. I mean, it's already the case, right, that some exchanges will block user accounts when they are associated to, uh, to coin join transactions, for instance. And in my view, yeah, it's going to get, it's gonna get uh, more fractured and, and, and worse in that, uh, in that case. Yeah, 
Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, um, you can definitely see it going that way. Um, I do think there is some silver lines as well, though, with like what's recently happened, like you mentioned, the kind of like mass orange pilling, just uh, decoupling um, away from all the, you know, all coins, all that kind of stuff. Um, I do think, though, especially when they go on about like, you say like self custody versus non custodial. Um, mm -hmm. Like if you take especially the EU regulation where they love that term, you know, hosted wallets and they kind of make it out that they want to yeah. in, implement the transfer rule or the travel rule um, and kind of make it so that Bitcoin can, and crypto, but Bitcoin can only be used within their kind of banking rails that they've already established or apply that legislation to mm -hmm. that. Like there's definitely a very good argument that could be made, made policy wise. Um, from just anyone really like to say that none of this would have been possible if it was the opposite where it was just purely everyone was self custodying as a general rule um mm -hmm. ftx wouldn't have been able to do what they're doing now so i i think this i because i know what you're saying like the regulators are going to come especially in the us and the eu they're going to come and say like we need to clamp down this industry but their way of clamping down is to try and force custodial regulation when it was actually the custodial platforms that were the problem so i think it just gives us good ammunition to to counter that like it's really like a very basic argument where you say hold on a minute like the answer is for most people to self-custody not do what they want to do which is implement custody um as a as kind of the law or whatever um or custodial solutions but the other thing as well and we spoke about this in the last conversation is like just interest to hear your take on this um around paper bitcoin like so it's kind of like the, the market is kind of unraveling itself between you know it's, it's settling back to who actually holds the actual balances of the, the bitcoin and digital assets um and people are being exposed like you know obviously ftx and these other platforms like blockfi or whatever they're they're being exposed to not kind of have what they said they have and there's a run being triggered like do you think this is kind of having the the effect that it diminishes the ability for exchanges to issue paper bitcoin and manipulate the bitcoin price um if they're all just i suppose wiped out well i mean um it, it's very hard to know how much paper bitcoin is out there right because you can't really audit that um and so if you think about this um then in my view the incentive for most platforms is to actually retain custody of funds because if you're operating on a fractional reserve um you know restricting withdrawal and and you know the ability for people to redeem their paper bitcoin um it limits your risk as as a fractionally reserved bitcoin bank if you wish it limits your risk of um liquidity issues and ultimately solvency issues which can lead to bankruptcy issues because there's no bailout in bitcoin so in my view and i'm not of course a, a guru or anything um but the incentives are are reverse uh we're going there's an incentive to yeah, to uh, to detach uh, the amount of paper Bitcoin against the uh, underlying Bitcoin that is held in custody by these firms. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, I agree. It's just a wonder, though, like like if say like you have the likes of QCoin and probably Crypto.com and all these companies soon that are going to try to you know stop withdrawals, um, leaving the exchange. So is that going to be the death knell for their platform then and just going to force the you know that it's it's a free market force just basically ending them for doing so and then it should hopefully encourage or it might hopefully encourage more not bent not um you know best practices in the future i.e one for one reserves now i i suppose to answer my own my own point there is that um in a few years this will all be forgotten about and it'll just happen again like with mount gox so <laughs> um <laughs> yeah so 
Okay. I, I think it, I think it's gonna keep happening. Uh, it's gonna keep happening because the incentives are there for it to happen. So unless, um, yeah, there's the, the you know, the market is efficient and learns from previous mistakes, which we've seen is not really true. Um, on a, on a bigger scheme, um, yeah, I don't think it's gonna. I don't think custodial platforms and and paper Bitcoin is going anywhere anytime soon if anything i think it's going to keep uh keep uh going up and the ratio of um paper bitcoin against the underlying bitcoin is going to keep growing in my view meaning that right now you know you and i know and everybody who runs a full node is able to verify for themselves how much bitcoin is actually in circulation today right now um i have no way of verifying how much paper bitcoin is out there but um I can speculate that there is there is more than the underlying BTC that is physically in circulation. And so what it does it mean? Well, it means that some um, some of these exchanges are already um, running fractional reserve operations and are you know either hoping to recoup that via fees, via withdrawal limits uh, on rate limiting, right? You don't have to freeze withdrawals. you can just limit it limit withdrawals on a weekly or monthly or daily kind of rate. And that already de-risks your, your um, exposure to uh, liquidity issues and insolvency quite materially. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, we shall see. But today, the, the civil lining is that I do believe a lot of toxic Bitcoin maximalists are being crafted because they've been burnt and are pissed off and sad and their lives are, for some of them, destroyed by this FTX blow up. Uh, will they get some funds back? Maybe, right? Who knows? Maybe FTX is going to be able to pull out some kind of a rescue plan uh, and bail out by another business or other funds, or maybe not. But I think, yeah, this the amount of fear, the amount of uncertainty, the amount of... of um, yeah, just uh, stress uh, in the system, I think is creating a lot of uh, a Bitcoin self-custody maximalists. And that's, uh, that's a good thing because ultimately Bitcoin is about this, right? It's about sovereign individuals taking responsibility over their lives and that, uh, that has a cost. It's very uncomfortable because most of us, we've been used to trusting institutions to safekeep our money and... Uh, you know, being able to um, ask for a, a password reset when we lose it is something that is very comfortable and convenient. But uh, yeah, it doesn't work for Bitcoin. You gotta, you gotta take that responsibility in your own hands. And so, yeah, that's how you, you gotta get burnt. Uh, most people, in my view, uh, myself included, you learn by touching the stoves and getting burnt. Um, it's sad, but uh, that's how how I personally work and I think how most people work. Yeah, I definitely, and look, you can kind of say we, we could have done tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of hours of education and promotion and marketing around self-custody and like, there is nothing that is going to do more for self-custody now than what's happened with FTX, <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, big time. <laughs> <laughs> so there, that's another silver line, I suppose, but, um. So just privacy then, um, I suppose this is the, the core, like this is what you're doing day to day. And to be honest, it's only in the past three to six months that I've really started to, like I was always interested in Bitcoin privacy, but really started to realize how big a deal this thing is going to be um, in kind of, say, keeping the, the state in check um, and it embrace being forced to, it's like what you said earlier, what you know be, being forced to embrace bitcoin rather than giving them room to maneuver to stop it um which i don't think they would be able to do in the long term anyway but it just makes the whole thing much longer if they can so was ab wallet um yeah what what is it and yeah what's was ab wallet how does it work yeah privacy very important topic and few understand this. Um, privacy, uh, so sorry, Wasabi Wallet is 
it's a free and open source Bitcoin privacy wallet, um, which allows you to essentially um, reclaim your privacy. That's sort of the, you know, in a nutshell, what Wasabi is about. Now, in terms of how it works and what it, you know, what how it functions, um, Wasabi Wallet um, has an implementation of CoinJoin. CoinJoin is a type of Bitcoin transaction. What it is is it's a collaborative Bitcoin transaction. So, as a user, I send Bitcoin to myself with others as part of the same transaction. And so, what it does is it breaks. Um, the link uh, and the traceability of my Bitcoin on the on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, so, in other words, any Bitcoin transaction has a given set of inputs and outputs. So, I'm gonna spend inputs and create new outputs, whether I'm sending money to me or to uh, a recipient, for uh, you know, in the case of a, of a merchant, and because bitcoin uses a model of uh, the utxo model which is unspent transaction output um, meaning all the inputs or in that case outputs that are available to be spent but are not spent right this allows us to get a really clear picture of the entire circulating supply of bitcoin that utxo set so that's a really good thing because it is transparent. Anybody can audit it and verify that, you know, down to the very sat, how many Bitcoins are in circulation at any given moment today, uh, yesterday and, and tomorrow. Um, but there's a, a trade-off. And the trade-off, of course, in that very open and transparent system is that privacy is, is very hard to achieve. And if you define privacy as the choice, to share information about you, right? Um, there's a good one from Eric Hughes, right? It's uh, it, privacy is about selectively revealing oneself to the world. So it's not about secrecy and hiding stuff from everyone. It's about deciding whether or not you want to share some information to someone or everyone. Um, privacy on the Bitcoin network, because it is so open, is very hard to achieve, as I said, right? Because there's always going to be a link between a given input and an output in any transaction. That's how it works by default. It It is a really good thing because it allows um, the prevention of double spending without trusting any central authority. So that's really good, it's very powerful. That's exactly why Bitcoin actually works um, and has value today um but there's this trade-off of privacy and so coin joins um they allow you to break that link between a given input and an output so if you think of the input as being uh, the origin of funds and the output as being the destination of funds well you, you break that link um, and so this is really good because you still allow anybody to audit and verify the entire supply and prevent double spending uh, while still being able to achieve privacy um, and so if you look at bitcoin from uh you know the monetary properties lens um and there's a really good book on this i have it on my shelf here it's the, the seventh property by eric yakes um shout out to this uh this uh, amazing uh, author and bitcoiner um there are six properties in money right and we all know them like for a store of value there's durability and uh scarcity uh when it comes to medium of exchange you have portability and divisibility um and when you have the third function of money which is unit of account you have recognizability and fungibility and of course eric wraps it up together or, or bitcoin uh wraps it up all together with a seventh property being immutability so nothing can change in those properties and that you know technically makes bitcoin uh the best money ever discovered but if you go back to fungibility fungibility means allowing or having any unit say for that money be interchangeable not remarkable from from each other 
Um, so truly, um, if I have one unit of something, I can exchange it with any other unit of that thing. Uh, it doesn't matter. There's no preference for any given unit. And that is fungibility. Um, and Bitcoin today, the, the, you know, the UTXOs on Bitcoin are by default not fungible because each UTXO has a very unique transaction history, right? If I take one UTXO today and I revert it, its history uh, back and back and back, at some point I'm going to hit um, the block subsidy um, from which it was discovered. Uh, also, you know, called a Coinbase transaction. Um, and so that very UTXO has a super unique history. Um, and all UTXOs have unique transaction histories. And so the issue with that is that some entities can refuse some to accept some UTXOs because of a particular transaction history that they've that they've had or a particular exposure to a given entity or activity or whatnot. And so fungibility is, is actually quite poor on, on Bitcoin by design. Um, and that is an issue because it severely rest restrict the ability um, to trade Bitcoin uh, freely. Um, and in other words, if some people have preferences for some Bitcoin UTXOs against others, because say they think they're more clean right usually this is something that is and clean is is you know between brackets um because oftentimes this is something that's being referred to by some businesses who would refuse utxos that are not clean well it creates a big friction in the way you exchange bitcoin and as a user of that money um it adds a risk because you never know if you're going to get um, a clean accepted bitcoin or quote unquote a non-clean not accepted bitcoin and so overall what it does is it increases the overall transaction cost um, and that's a you know a property of uh, of money is like you want it to have the a very low transaction uh, cost uh, because if it if it's affordable to use, then um, you know it's it's going to be used essentially by by many people. Um, and that's why, for instance, lightning is a really uh, really good um, achievement in terms of a medium of exchange, for instance. Um, so yeah, so privacy is very important for Bitcoin fungibility, which itself is is extremely important for for the uh the adoption of bitcoin as as a as the, the default money for for the world um and coin joins do uh, a, a really good part in uh, helping bring back fungibility to bitcoin yeah yeah god that's a really really good explanation um just leading on to like the same characteristics money bitcoin um why would like some people and it is some people basically they think that monero should just be like bitcoin for saving monero for spending um what do you think the argument is against that and do you think there's any merit in it i mean i you know naively speaking i would understand why some people believe that monero could be an interesting alternative because it has some um, privacy properties by default that Bitcoin doesn't when it comes to say, uh, you know, rank signatures and the sort of confidentiality of transactions. Um, the, the problem is it, it's all about um, liquidity and, you know, the ability to use uh, money in any given market. Money is the most sellable good, full stop. And the most sellable good mean that means that it has the most people, businesses, organizations accepting it against goods and services, other goods and services. Um, 
and that's not the case with Monero, for instance. That's not the case with any other alternative uh, crypto and shitcoins, right? Um, and so, essentially, it is futile to believe that you're going to have some form of technical improvements in a in an alternative shitcoin that will ultimately um, beat Bitcoin in terms of adoption. Uh, because again, there are all these properties that do matter uh, in terms of adopting money, right? Those seven properties. Um, and Bitcoin has won on many of those. Uh, in particular, of course, the sort of uh, scarcity and, and hardness of it, right? So some people would defend Monero and say, well, you know, Monero is as hard because it, it is a fork of Bitcoin and it has the same... Um, um, hard cap in terms of uh, of supply limit, um, but Monero, uh, for instance, if you compare it to to Bitcoin, um, has made other arbitrary technical trade offs in terms of the speed at which you know blocks are mined or the amount of transactions that can fit in a given block, and and I don't know. If I can trust the choices of, of these developers against what's you know been in production and used on on the Bitcoin network, um, maybe you know maybe it's an interesting experiment, um, but ultimately, it's not the most sellable good right now. It doesn't have the um, you know the buy-in I would say that some hodlers have on on Bitcoin, and fundamentally speaking. Um, it, it doesn't seem to to be, uh, for instance, scaling the way Bitcoin is scaling in layers. Um, and if you look at, um, you know, the the history of, for instance, the internet protocols and and the stack of TCP/IP, um, you realize that from ARPANET down to the the web and, you know, all these fancy protocols for email transfer and and web page browsing and all that stuff, it, it evolves in layers. Um, and the more specialized the layer, the better, right? The more specialized the protocol, the better, because you're always going to have to make trade-offs. And there is one trade-off that you can absolutely never do on, on the Bitcoin base layer, which is about auditability and verifiability of the supply and making sure that anybody can verify that there's no double spend happening at any given time. And that's, of course, by running full nodes. And to run a full node, it needs to be very cheap to run in terms of hardware requirements, of the memory usage, in terms of permanent storage. Um, and if you make any trade-off on this, then you're you're actually hurting the main value prop of that protocol layer. And Bitcoin has been very conservative to not make any uh, trade-offs. Some would argue that, for instance, SegWit was a trade-off with the you know other um, group of the, the New York agreement um, because now you actually have blocks that are over one megabyte because the witness data is outside of that block. Um, so that's, uh, you know, I think Francis Pullard was saying this, it's a permanent scar on, on the Bitcoin uh, protocol from that block size war. Um, and if you ask Bitcoiners today, like, you know, should other trade-offs be made? Of course, absolutely not, right? And so if you look at, and I'll end it, I'll end it here in terms of Monero discussion, but they, they do have trade-offs for, for, for that auditability property, for instance, um, with very sophisticated cryptography schemes, which may work or may not work. Right, they're less battle tested than, than the the cryptography used on on Bitcoin, for instance, which has been around for for decades. Um, so yeah, you want always to be on the conservative side of things when it comes to to that base monetary protocol in order to meet those seven properties. Um, and then, if you want to add privacy, focus on other layers. If you want to add scalability or expressivity in terms of um, creating interesting scripts and quote-unquote smart contracts, um, 
make it happen on other layers, but do not compromise on the on the uh, assurances that the base layer provides. Yeah, yeah, it's like you you don't want to ruin a good thing. <laughs> um, sure, and exactly. The, yeah. The the more you tinker with it, it's kind of stoking the flames a bit. Like you, you don't know what's you could introduce something that could just end up ru and it, you, it could ruin the whole thing and um it could make it much proner to regulatory capture as well you know if we're changing uh, bitcoin every couple of months for some new quote unquote improvement and i think that was mm -hmm. the good um the, the main takeaway from the whole block size war was it, it set bitcoin in this path to it should this is well recognized now and there should be enough people that realize this and enough people that run full nodes for this to hopefully always remain the case yeah. um so like just what are the implications of poor privacy then like for regulatory capture to so say no one cares about privacy and bitcoin starts becoming more and more and more regulated um yeah what are the implications of not taking good privacy precautions and bitcoin privacy layers and wallet implementations etc improving um what are the implications with this yeah well not having a choice to uh share to decide whether or not you want to share some information about your financial transactions um is um is quite bad in terms of personal security for instance right um, in terms of just uh, you know, let's take let's take real examples. Um, if my employer pays me in Bitcoin, and then can track my subsequent payments, they can see you know who I'm supporting when I do political donations, or if I um, decide to give a donation to uh, WikiLeaks or Tor, uh, they may not like it and fire me right um what if i make a payment to a friend um and that friend sees a big portion of my wallet because i have you know one big utxo uh, all of a sudden they see the amount of money i have uh and you know ask that i pay the dinner tonight because they're struggling financially or whatever uh, you know or just making making it an awkward situation right and again, uh, if it's a good friend and he's struggling, invite him for dinner. Uh, <laughs> but you know, if if you have a choice, this is good. If you don't have a choice because that information is is inadvertently leaked on the Bitcoin blockchain, this is different, right? And um, that is true for any transaction that you do, um, meaning that the person who paid you can track your future payments. And the person that you paid can track your balance, but also future payments uh, from from that payment. So um, this is basically not the default. Some people would say, "Oh, but you know, Visa, Mastercard, and and all these uh, payment and credit card networks are much worse when it comes to financial privacy." Because yes, there are some data brokerage firms which. You know, take a, a bunch of of data and and repackage it and sell it on the market um, to do targeted advertising and whatnot. That is true, um, but in my view, if you look at Bitcoin as this open financial network, in a way, it is on its track to become the world's most advanced financial surveillance network, um, because. By default, you have you have no privacy, and there's no um, law right now, or or you know regulation which protects consumer privacy on that network. And I'm not for regulation or or any of these uh, rules to be imposed, but I'm just stating facts that there's none uh, right now, and that by default, technically, this network uh, leaks a ton of of information. And the third piece is there's uh, financial incentive for some businesses to specialize in Bitcoin blockchain surveillance. Um, and so these businesses uh, make a ton of money essentially monitoring, analyzing, um, and reporting 
on all these transactions and working with other private businesses or public sector entities and you know all sorts of government levels whether it's federal provincial and whatnot and that of course uh is a massive you know attack on the privacy of bitcoin users and so it is uh in it, and it, it is because of this that it is important to um at least be aware that you know some amount of information is is going to be available to external entities that you may not have decided to make available by by default right um and then you know based on on that state of awareness uh some users will decide to not do anything about it and some this will decide to to take action um why well because lack of privacy can lead to censorship for instance uh it can lead to to violence or um you know just lead to awkward situations um that's why you know when you ask someone how much money do you have can you show me a bank statement like usually you're not going to be received really well because this is not a question that you're going to be asking to anybody you don't really know personally and even people you know personally you may not know that information if they decide not to share it with you um and so yeah it's um i think ultimately it's like with big trading firms and exchanges uh falling apart um some people will always learn and only learn uh when they get burnt and when it comes to privacy it's the same thing yeah so like i suppose it's akin to if no one cared about bitcoin privacy and hyper bitcoinization does happen everyone's spending bitcoin day to day everywhere it would be akin to in the world today just being able to look into anyone's bank account and see their balances um mm -hmm. but the, yeah yeah think but, about another another example really interesting one apple right they're about to release iphone 21 and they've been paying their suppliers and we live on a bitcoin standard um i mean if they pay their suppliers on chain and that information leaks that they bought this particular chip which allows some very fancy 3d rendering of stuff on the phone or whatever the new uh cool tech is at this time this is very bad commercial practices right to leak that type of information on on any payment network and so by default of this you realize the commercial implications of, of using bitcoin as a settlement net layer if all counterparties can be identified with you know reasonable probabilities it is it is a big risk and so you got you got to find as a business alternatives to protect yourself against espionage for instance um and i'm not saying again it's not going to say you know apple sent that much btc online right because bitcoin is a pseudonymous system you're still protected by that but as it is the case today if you look at um chain analysis providers for instance they cluster some addresses that they know are identified to given entities whether it's a bank whether it's an exchange whether it's a lender like it's already added as part of a uh, metadata on top of the bitcoin network information that is available so it is very plausible that big companies like apple because they're publicly listed they got to disclose how much bitcoin they're holding they got to disclose how it's held uh or where it's held in terms of addresses then all of a sudden they're trackable right and so they will not in my view and i may be totally wrong but they will not in my view uh use bitcoin if it's um that transparent for paying suppliers or yeah just getting payments from uh from products yeah so what are the solutions here um and are you optimistic super optimistic uh i think it's a it's an amazing time to be uh to be building on on bitcoin um and privacy is um is i believe um, a very important matter in the coming decade for bitcoin um on top of all the other ones you know all the other narratives that will uh, 
will be going against the uh, the growth of uh, and adoption of Bitcoin. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's a beautiful time to be to be building on, in my view, Bitcoin um, sovereign products, right? Like if we go back into that very simple dichotomy that I draw, right, between regulated businesses and that have no privacy and KYC and I uh, and deal with IOUs and on the other end, um, the sort of peer-to-peer -peer, privacy first, non-custodial Bitcoin only products and, and businesses. I think it's a really interesting time to be building for that because we're seeing the early uh, split in my view between those two. And um, there's a ton of interesting products and services to build for Bitcoiners and, and sovereign individuals who want to use Bitcoin um, in the coming decade to protect their wealth, to transact freely and, and do business in a, in a, in a global world. Right. So, so a ton of opportunity. Yeah. So let's, let's take then Wasabi wallet uh, or Wasabi wallet for privacy then. So say like, you know, 10, 15 years now, everyone's spending Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin is the currency of the world. You don't like, you, you don't have any choice you have to spend bitcoin you want to mind your privacy what does it look like is it something like someone has a hardware wallet or paper wallet or whatever to, to store most of their say money then you have intermediary was a b wallet and then you have like your spending wallet on lightning or whatever does it look something like that and then anything that you receive or spend goes into say your your spending wallet which could be maybe construed to look like a current account and then where your big balance is held or whatever you put that back through something like was ab wallet to maintain your privacy is it something like that or is it simpler or am i is it that a bit too simplistic oh man i mean uh there could be thousands of different ways and where we go right <laughs> uh like i said i'm not a guru i don't know but if i can take a bet on that um I think, um, yeah, there's going to be more people using privacy wallets like Wasabi. Um, and the real question is, okay, let's say today you have, I don't know, 0.0001% of transactions of Bitcoin um, that are coin joins. Um, and today they're flagged as being, you know, risky, for instance, and some regulated custodial entities don't accept them or funds coming from coin joins. what happens when you have one percent or fifty percent um of bitcoin transactions that are coin joins um then all of a sudden it becomes much harder to to distinguish because it, technically if you have two coin joins two sorry two um outputs coming from different coin joins and each of these outputs are one btc right technically they're indistinguishable from each other which makes them absolutely interchangeable um well in that future um again bitcoin fungibility would be would be a thing and so at some point, it would be very hard to decide whether or not you wanna you wanna block a given transaction uh, because of uh, an arbitrary transaction history. Um, and the point here is, you know, when you were, for instance, browsing the web ten years ago, um, most people were doing it on HTTP, um, and that had a bunch of issues because you could leak some personal information say your credit card number uh, because the traffic was not encrypted between the client which is the page that you were browsing and the server you know that was receiving your information if someone got in the middle of that boom they steal your credit card info today most websites rely on https so tls certificates and and that additional encrypted um, and security guarantee and that's great very few websites um, that are quite popular at least um, expose um, traffic over http only 
And I believe that it's kind of a, it's a good, useful, perhaps flawed, but analogy for, for coin joins, um, where today most people use Bitcoin um, kind of openly, right, without that privacy protection. Uh, and coin joins are kind of the HTTPS uh, of Bitcoin in a way. Um, they're, it's allowing you to, uh, to still transact on Bitcoin without leaking that information. And so without leaking any metadata or any personal information. And um, that's very plausible future in my view. It's a very real possible scenario where uh, there's just going to be more coin joins happening um, to protect uh, people from leaking uh, some personal information. And also with uh, additional um, technical improvements um, like cross input signature aggregation, uh, which are it's CISA, which would be kind of a, um, an additional um, technical improvement um, or technical modification, I would say improvement proposal uh, to Bitcoin, uh, you could actually see a world where coin joins, because you can aggregate signatures um, linearly using the you know the taproot uh, improvements uh, related to uh, this new signing algorithm, uh, which is Schnorr and not ECDSA, which is the current one. Um, and that's again, I don't want to get lost in the technical here, but um, basically. The gist of it would be that coin joins could be cheaper than actual Bitcoin transactions. And so if there's a financial or economic incentive for people to use Bitcoin more privately because it's just cheaper, uh, then you can get mass adoption. Um, God, that's that's actually, I wasn't aware of that now. Of, um, I, like I knew Taproot did have some implications for Bitcoin privacy, but that's actually massive because if, mm -hmm. if you know, block space becomes much more valuable with time, um, sending on chain will become much, much more expensive. And if they can all be kind of grouped together in a, you know, coin mm -hmm. join transaction, like <laughs> I see <Yeah>. smiling. <laughs> that's, no, that's... yeah, definitely. It's possible future. Just to be clear, um, CISA, so cross input signature aggregation is not part of the taproot. Uh, it's, it's an additional um, uh, soft fork, I believe that would need to be, uh, to be delivered, but um, yeah, it's a very interesting potential future development for Bitcoin. Yes, yeah, that could be a big deal. Just needs to make sure it's it's done right, <laughs> so we you know that we don't exactly yeah yeah because mm -hmm. any any change to Bitcoin is uh, is a potential. It's an additional risk, right? It's uh, it should be understood as a potential attack. Uh, and there's been some discussions recently on Twitter about this, right? With uh, the full RBF kind of drama uh there's no need to to get into it now i i believe but yeah it, it should be uh most changes in bitcoin should be uh considered with uh a high degree of skepticism and and uh a lot of conservatism yeah 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 so look just just a couple one or two more questions um like say with privacy what like privacy today so say you've you've bought a lot of kyc bitcoin um and you're you're starting to get a little worried about this um what what steps can you take to protect yourself mm -hmm, yeah i mean for instance if you are interested in learning about coin joins and perhaps doing a little bit of, of it to uh, to see how it works uh that's good it's a really good first step that being said any um kyc purchases that you've done in the past is 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 forever right um you've uh if you're using coin joins what you do is you're gaining you're not deleting all the all the kyc activity you've done in the past uh you're basically adding plausible deniability for future users of your bitcoin what does that mean well plausibility is a measure of probability and so plausible deniability means that potentially um, in future spends, um, the Bitcoin that you're using may not actually be the Bitcoin um, that you have. So what I mean by this is it it's not 
going to be clear whether or not you say you spent Bitcoin and you sent it to someone else or whether you're still controlling it in another address, right? Um, and so what what coin joins do is it it just breaks the the full history. And at some point, um, if done well, uh, and there are many other privacy concerns that you got to look into, coin joins are not the sort of magical trick that you that you do and that solves all your problems, right? But if you coin join, yes, you can basically add some degree of uncertainty whether or not the Bitcoin that you had purchased with KYC are still yours. And where do they go? Like the, the traceability is, is harder to do, basically. That's all it does. It does it, it does something very specific, but really well. And now, of course, as I said, there's a lot of other privacy concerns, like whether it is, you know, related to running your own node, um, dealing with address reuse, um, you know, using VPNs or Tor in particular to to browse uh, on, you know, say block explorers that are yours, right? Not using public block explorers when you want to check the status of a transaction. Like there's a ton of stuff. Um, privacy is a really deep rabbit hole, uh, but the good the good thing is there's a lot of uh, good literature online, a lot of good articles that help you navigate that. Um, and it can be a bit daunting when you start thinking about how to use Bitcoin with privacy conscious lens. Uh, but you should just get started and and improve gradually, right? It's like security; like you can't optimize for everything at once. The, the good thing is you start slowly and and um, and practice um, and then ultimately everybody gets it everybody is if you're if you're curious and willing to learn uh, you will get it you will be able to custody your own Bitcoin you will be able to you know coin join if you want to do it uh, and uh, take back control and reclaim your privacy uh, it's all a matter of willingness and uh, yeah, if uh, if you are curious and willing to learn, you should be good. Yeah, and I suppose like the UI UX um, is constantly being improve improved along the way as well. Like for instance, now it's much easier to self custody than it was five years mm -hmm. ago. I expect the same mm -hmm. is going to happen with Bitcoin privacy and coin joins in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the hope, right? That's why um, builders are out there uh, trying to uh, experiment yeah so just when you say like so if you're buying coinbase for example kyc is forever um what you mean by that is that it's i suppose coinbase have that data and they know you've bought that bitcoin and there's nothing going to change with that but like what you can do is if I, i'm just thinking for people that have bitcoin in hardware wallets and are starting to get concerned about this if if they hypothetically bought initially on coinbase they sent to their hardware wallet they can then send to a coin join or they can implement coin join um, through something like Wasabi on it. And then after that, like they, they can, it doesn't show that they've gotten rid of it, but it basically obfuscates, it kind of creates that break. So now afterwards you can't see where that um, Bitcoin is being sent individually. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Like, let's say you have you have a treasure, right? And you bought the Bitcoin on Coinbase, and you move the Bitcoin from Coinbase to your treasure in cold storage. That's great. That's a really good first step. What you should be aware of is that there's this link between Coinbase and your treasure, right? Your the the address on that treasure in particular, and that is you know anybody can see that link on on the Bitcoin uh, network on any block explorer. Um, what coin joins do exactly it would break the link if you from your treasure coin join right uh and so register inputs and get some outputs from a coin join it, it would break that link right and so now you if you you've done your coin join and you bring back that uh bitcoin to your treasure um you essentially broke that link between coinbase treasure coin join it adds that fuzziness and then you have some some coins in your treasure but it's very hard to tell where those bitcoin came from 
because if you take a, a Wasabi coin join uh, today and you can verify that on, on again, any book explorer, you would see that you get really big transactions, sometimes up to 300 to 50 to 350 to 400 inputs and outputs, which means um, that it can it could be technically 350 or 400 different users, different wallets, right? Uh, you don't know. Um, Wasabi doesn't know either how many users and wallets are involved. And so when you have similar coin denominations in that coin join, meaning that you have, I don't know, in there you're going to have 150.1 BTC outputs. Um, one of them um, is going to your Trezor wallet, but where does it come from? If you look on the input side of that coin join, there are another 200 different inputs that are 0.1, for instance, right? Very hard to, to actually tell. Um, and if, for instance, you're doing multiple coin joins because you can, um, right? Remixes, for instance, on Wasabi are, you don't pay the, the coordinator fee. You pay the network fees though, and that can be expensive, Bitcoin network fee, right? Depending on, on how much Bitcoin you're mixing. But you could do it one, two, five times, right? And so then the more coin joins happen, the, the harder it gets to actually rewind that history to find the link. It, it just makes it, you know, impossible. Uh, it's never impossible, right? Because there's always, so it's always a game of, of probabilities ultimately. Um, but it makes it highly unlikely. Uh, that the link is still there between your input and your output. And so, yeah, it's a way to, uh, to again, um, prevent Coinbase from tracking your cold storage funds, for instance, uh, yeah. which is a good thing. Yeah, yeah, Th that's really good. Um, I suppose, look, <laughs> we could talk for hours, a million yeah. questions, but um, maybe leave the rest of them for another time. But um, yeah, ju just, just to wrap up, like where um sorry so like what what do you think needs to be built that isn't being built in the space at the moment or it's not being done well i mean um uh, in my in my view what interests me the most these days is um financial services for bitcoiners which respect three principles so self-custody, um, privacy first, and um, of course, you know, Bitcoin only. Um, and, you know, yeah, these services which would allow more uh, activity that is peer-to-peer, -peer, that is censorship resistant, whether it is Bitcoin back loans, whether it is on and off ramps, so selling and buying Bitcoin, um, you know, whether it is inheritance planning, uh, security, so, you know, self custody schemes, which give me, you know, peace of mind for um, passing on, uh, you know, funds to my heirs. Um, you know, there's a, there's a ton of different uh, financial services products, but yes, in my view, they should respect the those those fundamental principles that bitcoin bring um and and that's a good thing also for if you're an entrepreneur or a developer because it means that you're not wasting precious time attention energy and money on regulatory compliance which is a massive overhead for any business operating in that realm uh, and it means that you can spend more money building a great product uh, or just saving those costs to your users and customers um, and yeah i mean ultimately i believe that the interesting bitcoin products and services that will stand and still be standing in 10 20 years are the ones that are the most resistant to censorship uh, and are the ones that are natively built on bitcoin and the internet um, without being stuck in a jurisdiction for instance, um, 
And so there are interesting ones out there, right? Uh, and I think, yeah, there should be just more. Because right now, if you look at the volume, if you look at the most business models that are profitable are shitcoin casinos and gambling uh, platforms. And that's a relic of the first big, I don't know, wave of, of biz businesses in that space. Um, but uh, yeah, where can you make money as a dev, as an entrepreneur building on Bitcoin? If you look at coin join business model, it's really interesting because it is um, it's a native business model to Bitcoin. You get a fee for coordinating uh, coin joins if you are a central coordinator. And that, of course, we open here a whole can of worms because it, there is some reasonable amount of censorship that can happen. Um, or you know in some other ways it could be seen as a central point of failure but regardless you're going to have to make trade-offs as an entrepreneur and that is an interesting business model because you earn sats for providing a useful privacy service to your fellow bitcoiners beautiful thing um, what else can be built uh, that doesn't deal with fiat right that's uh interesting questions to uh to think about and uh yeah if you can answer them then go build a business yeah i agree i, I thought about that a lot as well and still thinking about it um so where where can people find you to 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 learn more um yeah yeah i'm on uh, twitter regularly perhaps too much uh uh on uh, so it's t-h-i-b-m underscore dms open all the time uh always happy to chat with uh Bitcoiners and uh, shitcoiners who want to turn Bitcoiners. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. Okay, then. Look, thanks very much. And hopefully we can uh, get you back in the future for more privacy-related discussions. Sure thing. Thanks, Jack, for having me. It was a great chat. Thanks very much.